1990, uh, uh, я и моя жена жили в Торонто, и мы основали мессианское собрание. And we had people from Russia, Ukraine, Georgia. И там были люди из Украины, из России, из Грузии. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, распался, many of their friends and family came to Toronto. And they started to come to the congregation. And we had 60-70% of people only spoke Russian. So I wanted to be sensitive to the people that came. And I didn't want to make them all sit in one place in the congregation. And have to listen to a translator. So we bought some very expensive equipment. And very expensive little radios. So each service I gave people a radio. And they put the headphones on. And they could sit wherever they wanted. And they were so happy. And the whole time that I preached, they just had a smile on their face. And I thought I was the greatest preacher. One of my elders, Alexei Kochinov, He said to me, come here, I want to tell you something. He said, you're American. All these people come from the former Soviet Union. When you give them the radio, they just go to a station where they like the music. <laughs> And that's why they're smiling. So he said, let me teach you what you do. So we stayed after the service. And we piled up all the radios. And he put it on the station that they could only get the translation. And then he took all the radios apart. And he took out the dial so you couldn't tune it. And next week nobody liked the sermon. So, so I learned a very valuable lesson. I'm going to speak on uh, Mark chapter 13, which is about some prophecy. And before we even talk about it, I have to give you the explanation. And this is the way that we need to understand this. There's an old story of a rabbi sitting in his office talking to a man. And in the middle of their conversation, two men run in the office. And they're yelling and they're cursing. And the rabbi said to them, please, please, this is a house of God. What's the problem? So the first man tells his story. And when he finishes the story, the rabbi said, you know what, you're right. And the other man jumps up and starts to yell. He said, how could you say he's right? You didn't hear my story. So he tells the rabbi his story. And the rabbi said, you know what? You're right. And the man sitting in the office, he said to the rabbi, how could you say he's right and he's right? And the rabbi said, And you're right too. <laughs> so when it comes to prophecy, I know that everybody has different opinions. But just so you know, 
Хочу вам сказать заранее. Now that I'm older, I don't argue with anybody. Сейчас, когда я уже в возрасте, я ни с кем не спорю. So if you tell me that you think something different, поэтому если вы мне скажете, что вы со мной не согласны, I'm just gonna say you're right too. Я скажу, вы тоже правы. And this way we just stay friends. И поэтому мы можем остаться друзьями. Mark chapter 13 is probably one of the most difficult passages in the whole book of Mark. There's a commentator in the U.S. named James Edwards. And he has a good statement about this section. He says the idea of being on guard and not being misled он говорил, что сама идея того, что нам надо быть бдительными и не быть прельщенными, это основная цель вот этого Писания. It is not meant to be a blueprint or a timetable for the future. But it's more to encourage people to be faithful in the present. And we should keep this idea in mind as we look at the chapter. And the proof of this is so many people have taught on the signs of the times. And so far every one of them has been wrong. So we need to keep this uh, idea as we look through this chapter. Let's look at this few verses at a time. First uh, one and two in chapter 13. Учитель, посмотри, какие камни и какие здания. Иисус сказал ему в ответ, видишь сие великие здания, все это будет разрушено, так что не останется здесь камня на камне. Here we see Jesus leaving the temple for the last time. And the idea in the Greek is not just the building itself, but the whole temple area. He not only makes a physical break from there, but he makes the final separation with the temple and all of the ministry that happens. He leaves never to return. And the disciples and he start to cross the Kidron Valley on the west side. And as they start to go up the Mount of Olives, they see the temple complex. And then when they look down on this, one of the disciples says, Teacher, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. Uh, Nikolai, proceed first. What did they see when they looked from the Mount of Olives? Snow. <laughs> Okay. It's slow. It's loading. Oh, it's loading. Okay. Ah. It's not just the temple. You see the entire complex on top of the uh, Temple Mount. The sanctuary in the temple, all the side buildings. It was an incredible sight. And as they climbed up the Mount of Olives, if we could see the second. This is a view, I'm sure you've seen this picture many, many times. This would be a view from the Mount of Olives. And when they climbed up there and they looked down, of course there was no Dome of the Rock. But it was the temple and every building on the top of the Temple Mount. And it was an incredibly wonderful place. At this point in time, they had worked on the the temple for 50 years and, and they still weren't finished. 
и еще не до конца был закончен он. Он состоял из огромных камней. Josephus, our Jewish historian friend, Иосиф Флавий, еврейский историк, states that the temple was built of hard white stone. Писал, что храм был построен из белых камней. Some of the stones were 25 cubits long. Твердых камней, и многие из этих камней были в длину 25 локтей. And 12 cubits wide. И 20, 12 локтей в ширину. And 8 cubits high. The colonnades in the courtyard were so big that Josephus said it took three men with their arms outstretched to go around each column. The temple area took one sixth of the entire city of Jerusalem. Вот эта территория храма на храмовой горе занимала одну шестую часть всего города. One of the most impressive sites in the ancient world. К тому к тому времени одно из самых замечательных просто творений в том мире тогда. There's writing in the Talmud. В Талмуде говорится. Which gives us some good history. Который дает нам небольшую историю. And it says that the rabbis say. Сказано, что рабины считали. He who has not seen the temple in its full construction. Говорили, что тот, кто не видел храм в полном состоянии, has never seen a glorious building in his life. Никогда не видел более замечательного здания в жизни. Josephus also tells us about the temple. Иосиф Лави тоже говорит о храме. That when the sun came up. Что когда восходило солнце, it reflected off the temple itself. Лучи его отражались от храма самого. And it was so bright that you could not look at it. И было настолько ярко, что невозможно было смотреть на храм. You had to turn away. It was an impressive sight. Надо было только отворачивать взгляд, потому что настолько ярко было. And the disciples were impressed with these buildings. Поэтому ученики были так впечатлены этими зданиями. And that's why one of them mentioned it. Поэтому один из них так и сказал. But this remark tells us something about the thinking of the disciples. Но нам это показывает кое-что из того, как думали ученики. They still did not understand the plan of the Messiah. К этому времени они еще не понимали план Мессии. That he came to be the greater temple. Что он пришел для того, чтобы быть более великим, чем храм. So one of them says, "You see these buildings?" И один из них говорит: "Посмотри на эти здания." They are amazing. Они замечательные. And what does Jesus say? И что Иисус сказал в ответ? He said, "Do you see these great buildings?" Он спросил их: "А вы видите ли эти здания?" Not one stone will be left standing upon another. Все это будет разрушено, так что не останется здесь камня на камне. I think that must have shocked them. Я думаю, что этот ответ их шокировал. You know, Jesus gave many strange answers to the men. Иисус давал им часто такие необычные ответы. They expected him to say, "Yeah, they're beautiful buildings." Они, наверное, ожидали, что он скажет, "Да, замечательные здания." You know what? It won't be long before they're destroyed. Но они в этом скором будущем будут разрушены. And you think many times Jesus gave an answer like that. И Иисус много раз давал вот такой неожиданный ответ. When Peter said, "How many times should I forgive one someone? Seven?" Когда Петр спросил, сколько раз мне нужно прощать кого-то, семь раз? He said seventy times seven. Иисус сказал семьдесят раз по семь. When they were talking about people that were wealthy, когда они говорили о богатых людях, he said it's harder for a rich man to get uh, into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Иисус сказал, что богатому труднее попасть в небо, чем верблюду пройти через игольное ушко. The way to paradise is narrow. Что дорога на небеса узкая. Many go along, but few are chosen. Многие идут, но мало избраны. And he does it again in this section. И здесь он то же самое делает. It's beautiful, but there will be nothing left. Замечательные они, но камни на камни не останется. And this judgment was a literal fulfillment of the cursing of the fig tree. И это было буквальным исполнением пророчества о смоковнице. You remember Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and he sees the fig tree with leaves. Помните, когда Иисус со своими учениками шли, они увидели смоковницу, в которой на которой были листья. And Mark says it wasn't the season for figs. Марк говорит, что это еще был не сезон. But he went up and he looked for fruit. Но он все-таки подошел и искал 
плоды. And it says that didn't have any fruit, so he cursed the fig tree. И сказал, что не было на ней плода, и он проклял эту смоковницу. And sometimes people think this was very strange. Но иногда люди считают, что это странно. But I have a fig tree in my yard. Но у меня, например, есть смоковница, дома растет. And I know that even if it's not the season for figs. И я знаю, что даже если это не сезон еще для плодов. If my tree has leaves. Если на нем есть листья. There's some fruit on the tree. То где-то есть какой-то плод. And the people in ancient Israel, if they were hungry. И люди в древнем Израиле, если они были голодны. They would sometimes eat the unripe fruit. Они могли сорвать плод, который еще был не and the key to knowing whether there was fruit or not on the tree was that it had leaves. And Mark says it wasn't the season for figs, but the tree had leaves. When Jesus approached the tree, he expected fruit. And he cursed it because there was no fruit. And it's all in this context of the temple. That the temple had the appearance of godliness. There were the sacrifices that went on. There were the priests who were ministering and the Levites who were singing. So it had the appearance of fruitfulness. But there was no fruit in the temple. And when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it was a picture of the temple. It looked good, but there was nothing in there. And that's what he's talking about here. And if we could see the last picture. This is a picture uh, on the side of the temple mount. You see all the stones? This is the literal fulfillment of the words of Jesus. He made this prediction approximately 33 in the year 33. And in the year 70 the temple was destroyed. Exactly as he said. Not one stone upon another. And the reason for this was that when the Romans came and start and took over the city and started to destroy the temple, there was a rumor among the soldiers that there was gold hidden in the stones. And the soldiers pried the stones apart. Because they wanted to find the gold. And there was a literal fulfillment of the words of Jesus. You know, when Jesus told them that the temple would be destroyed, I think it was impossible for them to believe. And the only example I know from my life was when the Twin Towers in New York were destroyed. My two sons grew up when those buildings were already up. Оба моих сына выросли, когда эти здания стояли в Нью-Йорке. And that was big symbol to them. Это был большой символ. That was a symbol of New York. Символ Нью-Йорка. And if somebody said to me, and I look at those buildings. И если бы кто-то мне когда-то сказал, что посмотри на эти две башни. And I said both those buildings will be destroyed, there'll be nothing left. Если бы я сказал кому-то, что обе эти башни будут разрушены, ничего не останется от них. People would have thought it was impossible. And this was what the disciples were thinking as well. And it shocked them. And then we see in verse 3. Uh, what are you, 3 and 4? И когда он сидел на горе Илионской против храма, спрашивали его наедине Петр и Иаков, и Иоанн и Андрей, скажи нам, когда это будет, и какой признак, когда все сие должно совершиться? They sat on the mountain and it says the four came to them. 
Они сидели на, он сидел на склоне горы, и четверо учеников подошли к нему. Most of the time in the Gospels we see Peter, James, and John. В основном мы читаем, что Петр, Иоанн и Яков были с Иисусом. But this time Peter's brother came as well. Но в это время подошел еще и Андрей, брат Петра. Two sets of brothers. То есть две пары братьев. The first disciples that were called to follow. Одни из самых первых учеников, которые были призваны. And they ask him two part question. И они ему задают такой двойной вопрос. When will these things be? Когда это будет? And what is the sign? И какой признак? When? When will the temple be destroyed? Когда? Когда храм будет разрушен? What's the sign? И какой признак этому? They wanted a timeline. Они хотели график. They wanted to know what to watch for. Хотели знать, чего ожидать. The sign was not only to know when the temple was to be destroyed, but in their mind there was another thought. There was a theory at the time that the destruction of the temple was going to bring in the Messiah. Что разрушение храма повлечет за собой приход Мессии. You remember one of the disciples, Simon. Помните, когда Симон? He's called the Zealot. He was a political extremist. Он был политическим экстремистом. And the zealots believed that if the temple was destroyed, the Messiah would come because he would not allow that to happen. И зелоты именно верили в то, что если будет разрушение храма, то придет Мессия, потому что он не позволит этому случиться. And there's many people who believe that the zealots started that war. И есть многие люди, которые верят, что именно зелоты начали эту войну. That eventually resulted in the destruction of the temple. Because they thought they could force the Messiah to return. So these four called Jesus aside. And they wanted to know what do we need to know so we can be ready. And you would expect Jesus to give a direct answer. But he doesn't. Но он не дает им прямого ответа. С 5 по 8 стихи. Отвечал им, отвечая им, Иисус начал говорить, «Берегитесь, чтобы кто не прельстил вас, ибо многие придут под именем Моим и будут говорить, что это Я, и многих прельстят. Когда же услышите о войнах и о военных слухах, не ужасайтесь, ибо надлежит всему быть, но это еще не конец. Ибо восстанет народ на народ и царство на царство». И будут землетрясения по местам, и будут глады и смятения. Это начало болезней. The Messiah had a different goal than the disciples. У Мессии была другая цель, чем у учеников. He wanted them to follow God. Он хотел, чтобы они следовали за Богом. And not to follow signs. И не следовали каким-то знакам. They wanted that simple answer. Они хотели простой ответ. You tell us what to look for. Чтобы он им сказал, чего ждать. And then we'll be ready. И тогда мы будем готовы. And he said to them. А он им ответил. You be ready. Будьте готовы. And don't worry about the signs. И не переживайте о никаких знаках. Because you'll be confused. Потому что вас кто-то может прелестить. He said, uh, James Edwards again. James Edwards said, "There is a running admonition against future speculation." Что постоянно возникает такое замечание по поводу будущих споров. At the expense of present obedience. По поводу послушания. He said we shouldn't be looking to the future. Он говорит, что нам не следует заглядывать в будущее. Without being obedient now. Не будучи послушными сейчас. And it's a distraction. And there's many people who study the future. But they neglect their own spiritual life. And this is what was most important to him. He said, listen, be sure that nobody misleads you. But you keep your eyes on God regardless of what happens. And he tells them there's two dangers. The first is an inside danger. There's a danger in the church of false teachers. 
Many will come claiming to be from God. Многие придут, утверждая, что они от Бога. And we've seen this many times. И мы видели это много раз. People come with some new message, a different message, and they claim it's from God. Люди приходят с каким-то новым учением, утверждают, что оно от Бога. But Jesus tells us to watch out. Но Иисус говорит нам, чтобы мы были осторожны. False leaders come in God's name claiming to do God's work. It's one of the reasons why we need to be so diligent when we study the scriptures. We need to study not looking for proof of what we believe. Надо читать Писание, не ища каких-то доказательств тому, что мы верим. But rather what God desires of us. Но видеть то, что Бог желает от нас. And that's how we can know false teachers. И поэтому мы можем отличать эти, этих лжеучителей. If you don't know the scriptures, you can't know a false teacher. Если вы не знаете Писание, вы не сможете различить лжеучителя. I don't have perfect knowledge. У меня нет абсолютного знания. But sometimes you hear teachers and things just don't sit right with you. We have many people in the U.S. that teach that they can heal anybody of any sickness. I wish it was true. Does God have the ability to heal every time? Есть у Бога возможность uh, исцелить каждый раз? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does he choose to heal every time? Но решает ли он исцелить каждый раз? No. Нет. I don't know why. Я не знаю почему. All I know is that God has his plan. Но все, что я знаю, что у Бога свой план. And that he is God. Что он Бог. And I am his servant. And being God's servant means I accept his will as right. Whether I understand it or not. Sometimes God uses sickness to bring people to him. Sometimes God uses suffering to bring people to him. So when people come and tell me that they can heal everyone every Поэтому, когда люди приходят ко мне и говорят, что они могут любого исцелить, где бы он ни находился, That's one of the people that the scriptures tell me to watch out for. We also have many people who make the claim that no believer should ever be poor. God wants everyone to be rich. And usually the way they do that is they tell you that you can be rich by sending them your money. Somebody gets rich out of that. But it's not in the scriptures. Sometimes God allows us to go through difficult periods with money. You know, and again, uh, I don't know, I'm only the servant. But I trust God's word. So he tells us, watch out, don't be misled by people who are false teachers. And I think that Jesus talks very uh, clearly about this. Я считаю, что Иисус очень понятно говорит об этом. Uh, in Matthew 27, 21-23. Matthew 27? No, Matthew 7, 7. sorry, 21-23. Mm-hmm. Uh, от глава, um, с 21 по 23 стихи. Не всякий, говорящий мне, Господи, Господи, войдет в Царство Небесное, но исполняющий волю Отца Моего Небесного. Многие скажут мне в тот день, Господи, Господи, не от Твоего, не твоего ли имени мы пророчествовали, и не Твоим ли именем бесов изгоняли, и не Твоим ли именем многие чудеса творили, и тогда объявлю им, я никогда не знал вас, отойдите от меня, делающие беззаконие. This is a very scary passage. But I think he's talking about these false teachers. And their defense is that we did miracles in your name and we did works in your name. And 
And he said, but I didn't know you. Is it possible for those to who be misled who are true believers? Возможно ли, чтобы истинные верующие были прельщены? No, I don't think so. I think these are not true believers. Я думаю, что нет, что, наверное, это не истинные верующие. They think they are. Они думают, что они истинные верующие. But I think that's one of the reasons why there's shock and surprise on Judgment Day. Я думаю, поэтому они так удивлены и шокированы в судный день. That he tells them, I, I never knew who you were. Our best defense not to be misled is to know the scriptures. And to teach people the word of God. That is a good defense. But Messiah said there's not only inside things that might mislead you. But things that happen outside as well. Евангелие от Марка, 13 глава, 7 8 стих. Когда же услышите о воинах и о военных слухах, не ужасайтесь, ибо надлежит ему быть, но это еще не конец. Ибо восстанет народ на народ и царство на царство. И будут землетрясения по местам, и будут глады и смятения. Это начало болезней. Nations fighting nations, earthquakes, famines. Восстанет народ на народ, будут землетрясения, голод, болезни. All these things were well known to the believers in the first century. Все это было известно верующим в первом столетии. They not only heard about these things, они не только слышали об этих вещах, but they experienced them as well. Но испытали их сами тоже. And some people in this room have experienced these things. Our world is filled with sinners who cannot wait to sin against somebody. And these earthquakes happen on a regular basis. And unfortunately, famine still exists in our world. Just like in the world of the disciples. And the fact that these things happen show us the time is getting near for Messiah's return. But not when it will be. There's no timetable here. As the time goes on, things will get worse. Just as as a baby being born, the pain gets worse. Точно так же, когда ребенок, из тех, как ребенок рождается, боли увеличиваются. I believe when the time is imminent, Я уверен, уверен, что когда время близко уже, that true believers will know, что истинные верующие будут знать, that will be very apparent to us. То для нас это будет очень явно. But think how many times people have used these signs and predicted them as the end of the world. Но подумайте, сколько раз люди использовали вот эти признаки и предсказывали конец света. From the first century on. When you read the history of World War I, they used to call it the war to end all war. And we all know how wrong that was. As bad as it was, there was even worse to come. <laughs> Messiah calls us to look at history and at current events with a sober view. It's a caution to us. And these signs were given to let people know that even through uncertainty, we're to be patient and know that they occur in the will of God. And the last few verses, 9 to 13 in that chapter. Но вы смотрите за собою, ибо вас будут предавать в судилище и бить в синагогах, и перед правителями и царями поставят вас за меня, для свидетельства перед ними. И во всех народах прежде должно быть проповедано Евангелие. Когда же поведут предавать вас, не заботьтесь наперед, что вам говорить, и не обдумывайте, 
Но что дано будет вам в тот час, то и говорите, ибо не вы будете говорить, но Дух Святый. Предаст же брат брата на смерть, и отец детей, и восстанут дети на родителей, и умертвят их, и будете ненавидимы всеми за имя Мое, претерпевший же до конца спасется. Мессия говорит нам, что следование за Ним не будет простым. И даже говорит, сразу предупреждает, смотрите за собой. То есть идея в том, чтобы мы ясны были в своем разуме. We need to be sure of who he is and of his word. And when we're clear on those things, we can handle the difficulties that come. Uh, we must be clear of who he is in our relationship to him. Otherwise, we'll be cast around by every event that happens. One day people believe this and the next day that. Depends on the news they hear. And he says that disciples will be suffering just as their master suffered. That he was treated with contempt. And those who follow him should expect that as well. They were told not to escape persecution but rather to endure it. They were going to be handed over to the Jewish courts, beaten in the synagogues, and appear before kings and rulers because of the Messiah. And in the middle of these verses about difficulty and persecution, verse 10 seems strange. Because in the middle of this he says this, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. И во всех народах прежде должно быть проповедано Евангелие. And it seems strange because in verses 11 to 13 Mark talks about the difficulty. И это как бы немного странный стих здесь, потому что с 9 по 13 стих говорится о страданиях. The court trials, the difficulty with family. Говорится о судилищах, о трудностях с семьями. People hating them. Что люди будут их ненавидеть. Why would Messiah mention preaching the gospel in the middle of these descriptions? Remember, these things are happening because people were making a stand for the gospel. They were standing with Jesus. Many times it is through persecution that the gospel is spread. We don't always think about that. And if you're like me, it's not my favorite way to share the gospel. I've been, I've been to uh, evangelism conferences and I never saw anybody raise their hand and say, hey, why don't we get persecuted? It's a good way to share the gospel. But this is what Jesus says. In the middle of all these problems, you keep preaching the gospel. There's opportunity. It was because of persecution that the early believers were thrown out of Jerusalem. And even out of Israel. And they began to share the gospel around the whole world. And then when he says share the gospel, he said, look, you will be arrested. You'll be handed over to the courts. But don't worry about it. Because at the right time, the Spirit of God will give you the right words. The disciples' inadequacy would be replaced with divine aid. 
И их вот эта слабость будет заменена помощью небесной. И он говорит, он от внешних проблем переходит к внутренним. Что не только гонения будут от врагов, но их собственные семьи восстанут против них. И даже будут их умерщвлять. You know, this is an idea too that's difficult. Это тоже очень трудная идея. I mean, everybody knows sometimes you have a hard time with your family. Все знают, что бывают трудности в семьях. But people turning against you and turning you over to death. Но люди, которые восстают против вас, вас же ваши же родные предают вас на смерть. But as I'm sure you know. Но я уверен, что вы знаете. We had a very difficult election in the U.S. У нас, например, в Америке очень трудные выборы были в прошлом году. People were on this side or this side. Люди разделились с этой стороны и с другой стороны. And there was nobody in the middle. Никого не было посередине. And if you were on this side, если вы здесь находитесь с этой стороны, you hated the people on this side. Вы ненавидите людей с другой стороны. And the people on this side hated the people on that side. А люди с этой стороны ненавидят тех, кто с этой. Nobody was in the middle. Никого не было посередине. I know of many families. Я знаю многие семьи. Where people have not spoken to one another since the election. Где люди не разговаривают друг с другом с выборов. Because they were so angry. Потому что они настолько были раздражены и злы. And that's a small thing. Но это небольшая вещь. This has the, a spiritual element. А здесь есть духовный элемент. Satan himself is involved with this. Сам сатана вовлечен в это. And people will turn against their own families and turn them in. Люди обратятся против своих семей даже и предадут их. William Lane in his book. Один такой автор William Lane. He says there's three reasons for this. Говорит, что три причины этому есть. First is there will be a fanatical hatred of the gospel. Первое это будет просто фанатичная ненависть Евангелия. A real Satan-driven hatred of the Word of God. За которой стоит сатана, ненависть к слову Божьему. And this is already happening in the U.S. И в Америке это уже происходит. Not only are believers thought to be foolish. Не только верующих считают за неумных людей. But now people say that we're bigots. Но сейчас люди считают, что мы с презрением относимся к другим. That we're haters. Что мы ненавистники. It's become against the law to preach the gospel. И фактически вне закона сейчас проповедь Евангелия. It's hard to find a building anymore. Трудно найти даже здание. People don't want to rent to you. Люди не хотят вам сдавать здание в аренду. In the old uh, 50s and 60s. Например, в 50-х или 60-х годах. When they would plan out a community. Когда планировалась какая-то какая община, в смысле... They left a place for a church. That's no longer true. People even complain if you have a Bible study in your house. There's too many cars on the street. You see a hatred of the gospel. In the future too, people will be concerned with their own lives. It's just human nature. They will sacrifice the lives of even their own family to keep their own. And the third thing he says is that people want the approval of the world. And I can't speak for what happens here. But this is another major problem that we have. People are very frightened of what anybody else thinks. And they don't want to say anything unpopular. And Jesus is not popular. And the gospel is not popular. So we see these things already happening. And I heard many people claim promises from scripture. И я слышал многих людей, которые утверждают какие-то обещания из Библии. You know, sometimes we have difficulty in life and we think of a promise of God. Например, иногда у нас какие-то проблемы в жизни, и мы вспоминаем обетование Божье. But like people, 
standing up and wishing for persecution at an evangelism conference. I've never heard anybody claim this promise. Jesus said you'll be hated by everybody because of my name. Did you ever hear anybody, I want to claim this promise? It's part of being a follower. And he tells us, remain faithful. Don't worry about the future. Be obedient now. As follower of Messiah, persecution and difficulty will come. Some people teach that coming to Jesus will end all our problems. Anybody who follows God knows that's not true. And Messiah closes out the section by saying this. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now here I'll give you my opinion. And it might be different than your opinion. But when I was a student at Moody Bible Institute, my professor, Dr. Goldberg, he would always tell us, please feel free to disagree with me. And when we get to heaven, you'll see that I was right. So I say this to you today. Please feel free to disagree with me. And someday you'll see. But he talks about enduring to the end. And what is, is it the endurance that saves people? I don't think he, that's it. I think that's the proof that a person is born again. The endurance shows the decision, the in, inner decision is shown outwardly through endurance. It's a similar idea to James 2.14. Где сказано, что пользы, братья мои, если кто говорит, что он имеет веру, а дел не имеет, может ли эта вера спасти его? Если кто имеет веру, но не имеет дел. It's not the deeds that save the person. Дела наши не спасают нас. But the deeds are proof that a person is saved. It's that inner faith that shows outwardly. And I think that's what he's speaking about here. That when these difficult times come, the true believers will endure. And the false believers will fall away. So what can we say for sure about this passage? Messiah tells us be careful not to be misled. Be on guard. And the faithfulness he's talking about in this passage it's not really a timetable or blueprint of what's to come. But it's important that we think about where we are now. Faithfulness is not knowing or predicting the future. But it's entrusting God with the present. And I think that's the idea that Jesus was teaching his disciples. Let's pray.